In 2001, astronaut Chris Hadfield was on his first ever spacewalk, suspended 250 miles above the Earth's surface, an inky darkness so limitless it would make even a billionaire blush, when suddenly he felt something in his eye. And whatever it was, it really stung. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a spacesuit before, but getting something out of your eye when you can't access your eye kind of difficult. He tried to blink away the pain as his eye welled up with tears, but without gravity, the tears condensed into a glob of moisture, and it eventually drifted away right into his other eye. And there he was, still floating in that fathomless expanse so far away from home, hanging on with one hand, and he couldn't see anything. Hadfield's harrowing experience is an incredible story of facing your fears, whether your eyes are wide open or closed. But it's also an example of how inclusive design from the start can help solve universal problems before they grow into zero gravity globs. Hello, I'm Eric Stribling with Arizona State University's Interplanetary Initiative, and this is Space for Humans. Free floating in space and temporarily blinded, Hatfield knew not to panic. He remembered his training. He called his crewmate for help, and in time, his vision cleared and he got back to work. The problem, it turned out, was the anti-fog solution used on the space helmet's visor. NASA has since switched to a mixture of Johnson's No More Tears shampoo, making it a top choice for both babies and astronauts. But there's another way to think about the incident. Hadfield's spacesuit was designed exclusively for people like him. People who passed NASA's restrictive flight astronaut physical with 20-20 vision and strong hand-to-eye coordination. In other words, it was designed for our old friend, Reference Man. If the spacesuit design process had included blind and low vision people, for example, it would have likely given Hadfield more flexibility to explore his environment by touch. And this is the core message of universal design. When we include everyone, everyone benefits. And this is also the mission of Astro Access, a nonprofit organization focused on disability inclusion in space exploration. Despite research showing that people with disabilities could bring unique strengths to space travel, they have long been excluded from astronaut training. But Astro Access means to change that, imagining and designing a future that makes space for everyone. In October 2021, Astro Access took on its first ambassador group of 12 people with disabilities on a parabolic flight to conduct experiments in microgravity. A parabolic flight simulates the zero gravity environment by alternately flying up and down like a series of sloping sound waves. With each parabola, Passengers experience about 30 seconds of weightlessness. The Astro Access team started with a research question. What challenges would people with varied disabilities face in microgravity? And how could design modifications help? The goal was to find a way for each person to safely move around the cabin, return to their seat, and put on a harness. The ambassadors included blind and low vision people, deaf people, and wheelchair users. So design choices had to accommodate diverse experiences. Designers used haptic feedback, tactile surfaces, and lighting to communicate, and they added straps and netting to the walls to assist mobility. In case you don't know what haptic feedback is, think of the buzz you get on your phone when you get a notification, or the vibration you get on your controller when you win an epic game. Astronaut Katie Coleman, who joined the project as an advisor, was especially impressed by the flight suits. No more classic NASA one-size-fits-all. Instead, every suit was personally fitted to each ambassador's unique needs and abilities, optimizing safety and functionality for the microgravity bouncy house of parabolic flight. So what did they learn? Designing for inclusive space travel is not only possible, 
but surprisingly simple. On flight one, ambassadors successfully returned to their seats and strapped in more than 90% of the time. Innovations in touch and lighting technology offered solutions to communication and wayfinding challenges. Overall, the experiments showed how disabled astronauts could be both safe and effective crew members, laying the foundations for a more accessible future in space. But don't take my word for it. My name is Ann Capusta. I'm a former NASA engineer, a former director of research and development, and now a space consultant working on ways to use space for good, both in the future of space that we want to see and for problems here on Earth. Ann was also the mission and communications director for Astro Access Flight 1. And we asked Anne to tell us a little bit more about the benefits of inclusive design. Universal design benefits all. We've seen this time and time again here on Earth, and it's only natural that that will translate into the space environments. Take, for example, curb cuts here on Earth. Those are originally developed for wheelchair users to use sidewalks and exit back onto streets. Now those curb cuts are used for people with strollers, elderly. I mean, all of us use curb cuts, and that's an example of universal design. Another one is is closed captioning here on Earth. You know, closed captioning was originally invented for the deaf community. Know who the biggest user of closed captioning is here on Earth? Sports bars. By thinking about universal design, you can find solutions that benefit everybody. And in space, we often hear about navigation issues on station or disorientation or emergency protocols that would need to be in place in the case of a loss of lighting or things like that. And if we had designed already for users who are blind or who need vibral tactile feedback to navigate around the environment, those things are already embedded in the design of the space station and the spacecraft, and they can be helpful for everybody, including some of the problems that astronauts talk about now up on the space station. Even when they accept the benefits, critics question whether the costs of inclusive design are too high. Back to you, Anne. It doesn't have to be expensive. The thing is, is that this is a common misconception about accommodations and accessibility is that it's an expensive thing to take on. And so we often don't include it. But what Astraxis is doing is including it from the beginning. So if you make accessible and universal design choices at the beginning of the design process, it costs nothing more than making a non-accessible decision. Things like, you know, here on Earth, Building a bigger doorway to accommodate a wheelchair is no more expensive than building a smaller doorway when you're constructing the building. If you've already built that building with a small doorway and you need to go back and expand that doorway, that's where the costs come in because you're essentially redesigning after something's already built. So that retrofitting is why it's often seen that accessibility can be expensive. So Astro Access is really approaching that head on now when we're in this really pivotal point in space exploration where we're designing new environments, we're designing new habitats, we're designing new vehicles to go to space. And now's the time when we can put in these accommodations without it costing anything more. There are many useful takeaways from the Astro Access project. In space cities, tactile wallpaper could help people orient in zero gravity environments, signaling by feel or pattern which way was up. Additional handholds could help people move around more swiftly and safely. One of the most successful innovations was color-changing rope lighting, which the team designed to let deaf ambassadors know when to prepare to enter or exit microgravity. But they quickly learned that many other ambassadors preferred the lighting system to the audio announcements. Astro Access is working with parabolic flight companies to install this lighting system permanently but it could also help on commercial airlines. Think about it. How many times have you struggled to hear the pilot's voice over the sounds of crying babies, snoring snakes, or someone just playing Candy Crush without their headphones? According to Chris Hatfield, astronauts have a saying. In space, there's no problem so bad, you can't make it worse. But if we've learned anything from missions like Astro Access, it's that in space and on Earth, there's no problem so bad we can't make it better. And all it takes is a little collaboration, creativity, and a little bit of Velcro. Thank you for watching. 
For more information about Arizona State's Interplanetary Initiative, follow the links below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell for notifications. Okay. He called his crewmate, because we call like this now. Did anybody know?